Hi, everyone. I'm Anne Marie Slaughter, the CEO of New America, and I'm delighted to welcome all of you this afternoon to what will be a wonderful conversation about Bill Egger's new book, and we'll introduce that in uh, just a few minutes. But first, I do want to just tell those of you who may be new to our events uh, just a word about New America. Uh, we're a think and action tank uh, dedicated to renewing the promise of America, and we mean that the promise of America with a small p, as in renewing and unlocking the potential of all our people, and also the promise with a capital P, the promise of the Declaration of Independence, of being created equal, of equal rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, and to a government dedicated to the safety and welfare of its people. Uh, at the moment, uh, there's plenty of work to do uh, where we are becoming a new America, a plurality nation uh, with, that is powered by new technology and taking a new role in the world. One of the first orders of business is uh, renewing our democracy. Uh, and there are many ways to do that, but one of them is to ensure that government works. Which brings us uh, to our topic for today. Uh, we are uh, going to be talking about Bill Eggers and Don Kettle's new book, uh, Bridge Builders, How Government Can Transcend Boundaries to Solve Big Problems. And I will just, there is a link uh, <laughs> to buy it, uh, and I recommend it, but just to show it to you. Uh, I'm going to ask Bill and then I, my his fellow panelists to introduce themselves. It's a real pleasure to introduce Bill. I uh, One of the reasons I like this book so much is it is certainly very congruent with my own thinking. And I went back uh, to check. In 2004, I published my first book on transgovernmental networks. And I relied then on Bill. I don't know if it was your first book, but it was one of the first of the 30 that you and Don Kettle have read. Uh, I've written Governing by Network, The New Shape of the Public Sector. And it was by Bill Eggers uh, and Stephen Goldsmith, who was the mayor of Indianapolis. And back in 2004, it was about the shift from hierarchies or what uh, they call in, the, in, the, in this book the vending machine model of government to networks, to cross-boundary governance. So Bill's been doing this for a long time, and like most important and big ideas, they take a long time uh, to seed and then to take hold. But Bill, let me, let me ask you to introduce yourself more personally, and then we'll come to Ayushi and Jim and, and kick off the conversation. Uh, great. Thanks so much, Anne-Marie. Uh... I'm the executive director of Deloitte Center for Government Insights, and I consider myself a tri-sector athlete because I've uh, worked in both the public sector, private sector, and nonprofit sector over the years and have been incredibly passionate about networks and public-private partnerships, and I'm so happy to be here today. And Anne-Marie, your, uh, uh, your book, looking at this from a foreign policy perspective, Chessboard and the Web is one of the, one of the major books that we uh, learned from in the book. And it's been, it was so revolutionary in so many ways. So thank you for your contributions to this field. Thank you. Uh, and you can now tell that this is a mutual admiration society. Uh, Ayushi, let me turn to you and let, me, let you introduce yourself. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Uh, really happy to be here and discuss your book. Um, I am Ayushi Roy. I am uh, at New America. I serve as the deputy director of the New Practice Lab. Um, and as the name implies, we are working on this sort of new practice of connecting um, various players across the policy and uh, implementation arms across government and non-governmental bodies. Um, prior to my time at New America, I also served um, as a product manager um, and spent time, uh, similar to you, Bill, on the private, public, nonprofit side, um, connecting a lot of different players focused specifically on service delivery of government services. Um, and I teach uh, even today about digital governance and partnership models at Harvard Kennedy. Uh, so it's a pleasure to be here. I will pass it over uh, back to Anne-Marie. I will pass it to Jim. I thank you for having me. Um, Jim Thompson, I'm with the Office of the Director of National Intelligence. Um, I have been in federal government now for the last 30, well, 30 plus years. 
I've uh, spent over 20 of those now um, in building public partnerships. I was lucky enough to work with Anne Marie at the Department of State, uh, where I was Chris Balderston's deputy. Um, and we launched the Global Partnership Initiative at, at State and, and built a number of great public private partnerships that still exist and are still going strong. Um, big fan of Bill Eggers. Um, he's written the book. He's written many books um, on the importance of this topic. And I'm really excited to be joining all of you today to talk about um, the role of the bridge builder in the federal government. Terrific. Yeah, Jim, I remember well, Secretary Clinton always talked about the three-legged stool, the, the public, private, and civic sectors, and that you needed all three uh, to make things work. But at the time, when you and I were in government from to, uh, 2009 to 2011, it was new at the State Department to have an office to reach out specifically exactly the, the work that you and Chris Balderson did. So, Bill, we're going to start with you and ask you just to introduce the main themes of the book, and then we'll we'll uh, dive into a discussion. And then all of you will have time at the end. We'll save 15 to 20 minutes from four questions from the audience. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Anne-Marie, and what an amazing group we have here today. So why don't we, uh, why don't we move on to the, the next slide? And I'll start off with, so my co-author, Don Kettle, and I, we've been in the business of improving government for over 75 years between us, and we published close to 35 books on public management with a real focus on implementation, an area where within the think tank world and media in general, and even sometimes within legislators, there's really been a dearth of focus compared to policy with the very notable exception of New America, uh, which I think does more work on implementation and policy through the new practice lab and other labs that they have than just about any other think tank in the country, and which is why I love it so much. And one thing our experience has really taught us is that we need a new approach to solving big problems, a new way of thinking about government, a new mental model, really, to help people expand their vision of what government can and should do uh, to be effective. And so we really try to provide a fresh, comprehensive approach to thinking about public management in the 21st century. Next slide, please. Now, uh, Anne-Marie mentioned the vending machine model. and really for the problem is for decades we've largely had a mental model as government as a kind of vending machine you have a problem you pass a law you build an organization to deal with it you put money in the slot and you expect it to yield results then when the results don't meet the expectations we look for someone to blame and this mental model is largely obsolete it doesn't at all reflect how most government actually operates today which is often horizontally through these complex public-private networks. So effective implementation, effective public management requires expertly integrating and managing these networks. And that's what this book is all about. Next slide, please. So here's the crux of our argument. No problem that matters can be solved anymore by a single organization. And I want you all to like do a little, think about this for a minute. Can you think of any problem that matters that can be solved by a single organization. If you think of one, please put it in the chat. We ask this to audiences all the time. Very, very difficult to find one. Next slide, please. Because most societal problems extend far beyond the boundaries we've set for them. Take homelessness. Is it an economics problem, a jobs problem, a mental health problem, a drug problem, a family problem, a criminal justice problem, or is it a problem for government? nonprofit organizations, individuals, local government, states, federal government, the private sector. And the answer to all these questions is yes. And think about some of the other really tough problems we're facing today, whether the train derailment in Ohio, housing migrants at the border, a shortage of cancer drugs. Each of these issues pops up as a flare, a brilliant light that flames out, and then we move on to the next crisis. What we don't realize is that they are all the same problem, each wearing different clothes. There are cases where the only solution is weaving together people and organizations to provide solutions. Next slide, please. This has very big implications for how we get things done in government today. We need a symphony approach. Think about an orchestra. You have experts in violin, the cello, the flute, 
and they all need to come together to play from the same music for great performance. And the same idea in government, but in this case, it's for better social outcomes. So how do you do this is really what our book is all about. Next slide, please. Now, at the core of blended government are the orchestra conductors. We call them bridge builders. They do the hard work of convening and aligning all the different players. They can see beyond organizational boundaries. They break down silos to improve outcomes. They seek mutual advantage across sectors and align incentives to achieve shared goals. And bridge building, we believe, is probably the most essential skill set leaders and managers at all levels of government vitally need today. And it's the kind of work that Jim has been doing around national security and that Ayashi has been doing. And we just need a lot more people with those sort of skills inside and outside government today. Next slide, please. So in the book, we lay out 10 core bridge building strategies. I don't have time to go through them today, but to learn all about them, you're just gonna have to buy the book. And next slide, please. So the, the problems governments face and the solutions governments need today inevitably build on blended government. And governing this system requires bridge builders and not dozens more, not hundreds, not thousands, but millions of bridge builders. And I really hope uh, that all of you who are listening today uh, are going to be inspired to be a bridge builder. And I want to thank you for those of you in public service for your commitment to this. And with that, Anne-Marie, I'll turn it back to you. Great. So, Bill, thank you. And I'll just say, I love this idea of leading as bridge building, right? We, we, we think about bridge builders and we think of them, you know, as people who are conflict resolvers. Uh, they're, they're people who bring two opposing sides together. But this concept really has bridging and building together as, as two activities that are essential for leaders who must cross sectors because we must cross sectors uh, to get things done. There are all sorts of implications there about uh, you know leading from the center, not from the front, uh, sort of sublimating ego there. But it's the, the concept is new in the context of leading. And that's really one of the things that this, this book does so well. But Ayushi, let me turn to you and ask you to sort of reflect on this approach in the context of the new practice lab and the new practice of public problem solving uh, that you've been engaged in, which is very much uh, both bringing, working across government, but also working uh, from with government uh, and other actors as well. Absolutely. You know, I'll I'll take us back to a, a pretty key moment um, in the loss of trust in government. Uh, we're talking about healthcare.gov. And this was a really big moment, um, particularly in the delivery of a service that had been promised for a long time. Um, the site went live. It was so much excitement. And the site served six people, six Americans before it crashed. And in the aftermath of the experience, which involved all sorts of policy folks, technologists, um, other sorts of agencies outside of government organizations, um, in that sort of retrospective experience, what we realized was we hadn't had all the right people in the same room. And I know that sounds simple, but it actually is a, it's a big deal, right? To make sure the right players are at the table. And um, that's sort of where the, the birth of the new practice lab came about was from that experience and thinking about how can we make sure to not replicate that experience and other sorts of service delivery contexts, whether it's unemployment insurance, whether it's paid family leave, whether it's the earned income tax credit or the child tax credit. And so the new practice lab works to center families and the experience of families while bridging policy design folks and policy implementation folks. And when I say those terms, I'm not just looking at policymakers sitting within government. I'm looking at the world of people that work on implementation and design um, within adjacent to, we're talking about vendors, we're talking about nonprofits, advocacy groups, um, uh, so on and so forth, as, as Bill mentions in, in his book. So that's a little bit about the new practice lab. And I think we, we're trying to practice a lot of what um, is described in your writing. So one of the things that is most uh, interesting about this is 
you know, you think about Hamilton uh, in the room where it happens, and indeed our own Peter Bergen now has a new uh, Audible podcast called In the Room, right? And we're all in Washington, whether we're physically here or virtually here we're in, in Washington, and it's all about In the Room when it where it happens and wanting to be there. But the assumption is that that should be the smallest group of people possible, right? That's what makes it so important about being in that meeting is it's the key decision makers. And this whole approach says, no, 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 right? You have to get more people in that room and you have to get them in at the beginning. So Todd Park, of course, who was uh, uh, helped save healthcare.gov, he came in and it, uh, and first for, for health and human services and then became the chief technology officer for the whole government. He always says that had he been in the room where the decision to build healthcare.gov was made, there would never have been a healthcare.gov. It's not just that whatever was built would have worked. It was that it was crazy to design one website for you know the the tens of millions of Americans who are going to need healthcare. Uh, so that idea of getting technologists at the table, but also getting the people who are going to sign up for that technology at the table and all the other people you need across government and others. So, Jim, that leads me to uh, turn to you about the, the specific networks you're building in in the national security arena, where if we think that group should be closed in domestic policy, we want to get it ever more closed in national security, right? An ideal meeting is three or four, right? The head of head of the of the intelligence community, the head of the Pentagon, maybe state, maybe, uh, and the national security and, and the president and the national security advisor. So, talk a little bit about how you're approaching this. Yeah, so we definitely want to blow up that model. Um, we need to actually be more expansive uh, and bring more people into the conversation when it, re, uh, when it in regards to national security. It's really important for us to be talking with our private sector, to be sharing information with our private sector, um, for the intelligence community to be protecting our private sector um, as, as they're under threat, as well as we are under threat uh, from our adversaries around the world. Um, I think back to the partnerships that we launched at the State Department, uh, and and you know, so many of them jumped to mind um, that really are national security related. If you think about the U.S. Water Partnership that we launched with Secretary Clinton, um, that one we used information from Coca-Cola, uh, their worldwide strategy to water basins around the world and stresses on water, we use their information to inform our national strategy as it related to water during the Obama administration. Um, I'm not going to talk about the uh, Alliance for Clean Cook Stoves uh, because that's all we talked about for a long time. But one of since it's Pride Month, I will just say, you know, the Global Equality Fund is something else that we launched. And as we look at places like Uganda right now, um, that have cracked down on the LGBT community, um, sadly have you know, joined 11 other countries that punish same-sex relations um, by death. Um, and we have 69 other countries that criminalize homosexuality. Um, there's a lot of work still to be done, but by bringing corporations together with countries, um, we are really trying to address um, the root causes of the problems as it relates to people targeting human rights abroad, which is again another national security um, uh, concern of ours. Um, and and that, that partnership is really incredible to me. I mean, we've had over 15 partner countries join it, this platform that we created, where they're writing checks to the State Department to do this incredible work abroad. We're expecting $24 million this year uh, in funding. Uh, we have over 20 corporations and foundations that have signed up and have been partners and are contributing to the fund. Um, you know, and it's 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 operating in over 100 countries, um, and you know, it, sometimes without the knowledge of those countries that we're that we're in. Um, it's an important uh, it's an important platform, but it again it really brings the private sector together, their technology, their networks, uh, their funds uh, to work with the government to improve the uh, plight of human rights around the world. You know, and it, as I'm listening to you, I'm thinking about 
how different that work is than the formal work of diplomacy. I mean, the formal work of diplomacy is not really much different than it was in the 19th century, right? I mean, all the protocols around the visits and the formal dinners and the, the speeches, and it's this highly scripted, elaborate um, dance between nations. Uh, and it's, it, it requires a great deal of work to carry it out. And there are all these formal ways that you complain to governments when you're unhappy with them. But it's very different than this kind of work where you are you're identifying corporations, civic groups, maybe universities, maybe faith groups, all the different people who might be involved in a fight for equality or climate change or pandemics so, and food security. And you're reaching out to them. You need diplomatic skills because you're bringing people together and organizations together that don't always fit. But it's often done very quietly, as some diplomacy uh, is as well. And you have to you have to have a kind of cultural competence uh, to know how to engage with all those actors, just as much as you would need to know how to speak another language or you would study, you know, the culture of, of another country when, when you're going to visit to, un to understand it. So, Bill, I want to come back to you because you write about cultural competence, and I'd love to hear you, you talk a little about that. Uh, and also, you have those 10 strategies, and we can't go through all of them, but they really are Terrific. I would love to teach this book and, you know, structure a week on on each one. You you talk specifically about a kind of pursuit of shared advantage and a focus on common outcomes. Those are just just two. Um, so if you could sort of elaborate more on what's different, you know, when when you sit when you start out either in government or again in a think tank uh, trying to, to solve problems from this perspective. Absolutely. And by the way, uh, for teaching the book, there is a in, in the appendix, there's a whole section on how do you teach this book, because we truly hope that it's going to be used in lots of schools of public policy and public administration. And uh, Don, of course, is, is his textbook has been kind of the main textbook used for public administration for many years. So I, I think we profile a lot of individuals in the book who are really, really fantastic at, in terms of the cross-cultural competence. One of the ones I'm gonna uh, mention right now is uh, John Hickenlooper, uh, the first mayor of Denver, governor of Colorado, now oh, senator. Yes. And uh, what Hickenlooper did, has done, he, he really made public-private partnerships at the very center of his governing authority. Uh, over time, over the time as Denver mayor, he cobbled together partnerships to raise $295 million for efforts ranging from homelessness prevention to workforce development. And he had really an unwavering determination to work across the sectors, find points of mutual advantage for all of his major policy initiatives, go beyond partisanship, and he made it at the core, and he came out of the private sector. He owned a he owned a bar, and um, he was this very successful small business owner when he came into government. So he really understood that side of things. And one of the quotes we use from uh, Senator Hickenlooper, he talks about how government is very different than the private sector, but in both cases, people generally start with a narrow self interest, starting with what they think. They really need to get out of each negotiation. But when you get different voices at the table, it's not that difficult to show people that they can benefit from a broader variety of outcomes. And once you get alignment on the self-interest, you start to see overlaps. And that's where these transactions happen in the private sector and where you can create real change and progress. He actually looked at diversity, diversity of thought and the diversity of kind of even goals and everything as an opportunity to craft something more powerfully. And a lot of the bridge builders we, we profile in the book, whether it's from James Webb, who really was instrumental in putting a man on the moon, or even all the way back to Claire Barton, the founder of the Red Cross. This is something that they all had in common was this really, really terrific ability to understand the different sectors and then to find out a way of weaving together. I'll say one last thing during the Obama administration, towards the end of the administration, they had a whole initiative on 
cross-boundary leadership. And it was all about bringing people together to say, how can we create more of these tri-sector athletes? How do we get more and more people who have an expertise in doing this, who can move between the sectors seamlessly and their understanding of the sectors then allows them to create that mutual advantage and to leverage all of the skills and capabilities and investments from each of the sectors. Great. So Ayushi, I know this is at the heart of the new practice method. Maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the specific projects where you know, we get the people who are at the supposedly at the receiving end of the benefits the government is supposed to be providing, actually talking about what it's like to access them uh, and, and engaging directly with government officials. Absolutely. Yeah, as you were speaking, Bill, and I had the opportunity to read your book, it, there were so many moments I'm just kind of nodding along um, as I'm going through the pages of, you know, particularly some of the Clara Burtons and other folks you mentioned, um, Hickenlooper, of course. And I'll give you an example, you know, during COVID in particular, I think something that you spoke of in your book resonates deeply, which is, um, you know, the, there was a story that you mentioned about the, in during 9-11, half a million New Yorkers evacuated by the US Coast Guard organizing so many other, in creating a flotilla out of, you know, yachts and tour boats and other sorts of vessels. Um, and, you know, all I, I bring that story up just because I think the role of coordination is so key in being able, the code switching, the coordination is really key. And one of the things that he said, and that you wrote about in the book is, I think I broke more rules that day than I've enforced my entire life or my entire career. I'm getting the quote wrong. And that quote really stood out to me because I'll say we saw that at the new practice lab quite a bit during COVID-19. Governments all of a sudden needed to be able to deliver services overnight to constituents who needed paychecks, who couldn't make ends meet, who had lost their jobs. And the real work of implementing and reaching, putting dollars in pockets, meant that you had to reach across aisles and silos and you had to develop a cultural competence that maybe there wasn't need for before. The new practice lab worked on a unemployment insurance playbook. And um, I'll, I'll do a quick plug for those that are maybe listening and work on UI. Um, it's called Improve Unemployment. Dot org. It's it's you'll find it. There's a whole thing we go through line by line, everything from identity management, digital identity, and uh, creating just a UI account to alt to payments. Right, at the very end um, of the cycle. And one thing that we found is you cannot go through the constituent journey, the experience of a claimant, without touching every single one of these three sectors and more. Um, to begin you need to submit the application. You're going through most likely a government run application that was built with a private vendor. Mm -hmm. Then you're being screened after you've applied, you're being screened for whether you are eligible or not and to what level you are eligible for a certain amount of dollars. That is going through yet another backend system with another database, another set of players. You probably even got to the application in the first place through the support of a nonprofit navigator. <laughs> who pointed you towards the UI system in the first place. And at the very end of the chain, in order for you to receive your payment, there had to be coordination between private sector finance players, government players, and government vendors to be able to initiate and then for you to receive that payment, maybe in your bank, if you are a banked constituent. And if you're unbanked, then the step goes even further deep into private sector players to make that possible um, with prepaid cards or what have you. And as a result, I'm just kind of painting the chain here because that's what we found at the lab, right? Is you, you really needed it, it emphasized, especially during COVID-19, as unemployment insurance websites were crashing, the value of government players um, creating a larger, creating a big tent approach and creating a, a human-centered, a claimant-centered North Star that multiple players could really get behind. I um, I'm t I, as you're talking, I'm thinking about that vending machine and I'm thinking about, you know, what's at the back end of it, all this tangle of different actors as you kick it mightily to get it to either give you whatever it was you wanted or your money back, neither of which is often forthcoming. Um, 
but absolutely that tangle of different entities and what it takes to work across them and, and to align it. Um, Jim, w one thing I know that we encountered at state, and I'd be interested to hear from your work now as well, you know, government isn't set up really to address entities that are motivated by profit, right? I mean, the whole point of government is that you're there for public service. It's not, it, you know, you use taxpayer dollars. Um, often there's more alignment with nonprofits, although they're very, very different. But what do you do when you encounter, you know, entities that have to be motivated by profit because I remember talking to CEOs when I was in government and they were like yes we're we're all for corporate social responsibility we're all for doing good work but you know in the end we answer to our shareholders and we have that obligation and we can't just deviate from that because you want us to do something with public purpose so talk about that that clash between public purpose and private profit Oh, that's a great question, and it's one I've been wrestling with for for twenty years. Um, so I'll I'll take us back twenty years ago. The U.S. Agency for International Development launched the Global Development Alliance, and, and it was a first time that they they turned an idea of public private partnerships into a business model for how the agency would engage with the private sector uh, and and furtherance of development. Um, and to your cultural question. And that upset a lot of the foreign service officers at USAID at the time. I had heard multiple from multiple times, multiple people coming to me and saying, look, if I, I joined the foreign service, I joined the civil service at USAID to, to help other people. If I wanted to work with the private sector, I would have gone into the private sector. And now you're telling me I have to work with the private sector to accomplish what we want to do. And, and I said, yes, actually you do, because they're the ones that are going to be on the ground in developing countries, making a difference. They're the ones who are employing people. I mean, USAID does employ people, but it, you know, and a, an aid mission is not that big. You really want to talk to companies about their employment practices, what they need to expand, what their opportunities are on the ground to, to maybe go into a new country. Um, that creates more economic opportunities for people to find employment, to get health care, to educate their children. It really helps to grow that pie um, so that more people are brought into the system. And that's why we talk to our foreign service officers about the idea of this importance of working closely with the private sector and making them profitable, actually making them succeed in business because it's actually good for people. And I'll, I'll stop and just say, this is really important for all of us, not just in development, but across our national security uh, work. Um, and I was very excited to see OPM this past spring um, call for stakeholder engagement as part of its future of the workforce. Um, and and I, I, I looked at that and I was like, that's awesome. They're actually calling us to do stakeholder engagement, but who's gonna do that? Who within the federal agencies is going to do this important work of stakeholder engagement? And you have a few offices of public-private partnerships in, at State, at USAID, Millennium Challenge Corporation, and, and, and several others. But you know, you look across the breadth of the federal government, and and most agencies still haven't quite gotten there. There's a person or two, they've been thinking about it, but there's no policies, there's no procedures, there's no roadmap for how do you engage with the private sector. Um, and it's important, I mean, even for those of us who are working in this space right now, we are either management analysts, program analysts, foreign service officers, business analysts. There's no job series. There's no job series that says public-private partnerships or stakeholder engagement. I've been advocating now for a while about the need for a partnership officer job series. Um, it is the future of government. Bill has identified this for us. And I am a firm believer in it, obviously. I, I'm a practitioner of this. But it really takes a, a type of person that brings a unique skill set. And the job series that I listed previously don't have those skill sets. Those skills include things like the ability to communicate, do strategic planning, um, ideation, a huge piece of it, networking, 
marketing. I mean, I, I go out and I sell the U.S. government. How many people are in government who are thinking of themselves as market specialists going out and selling, come work <laughs> with us, get the opportunities that we present within the U.S. government to come and play with us. So you need collaboration, innovation, negotiation, acquisition, um, and empathy. You actually, for yes. the marketing piece, you need to be empathetic. You need to understand what's in it for them. So when you are actually talking to them, you're speaking why it's important for them and what they're going to see in the end. And bring it back to your question. It's about profitability. So yep. that's that's why I've been calling for a partnership officer series. And you know, I've been add, oh sorry. I would just go add, ahead. No, Bill, jump that, in. Uh, you know, we have examples of agencies, federal agencies that are really good at this. Uh, and DARPA is is one certainly, and NASA. I mean, NASA and DARPA are what we call catalyst by design agencies, where all throughout the organization, not just within a public-private partnership office, that there's a culture of forming these partnerships and engaging with the private sector and acting as a catalyst for wider societal innovation. NASA utilizes public procurement, grants, contract, prizes and challenges, and many other tools to stimulate the commercial space economy, uh, encouraging entrepreneurial ventures, technological advancements. They have people who specialize in market sensing uh, over looking at the different technologies. They have other people who are specializing in engagement. And if you look at the growth of the space industry, most of that would not have been possible without NASA. And NASA really has a commitment to nurturing talent and creating incentives for commercial partnerships to drive innovation. And so there's a lot we can learn from agencies like NASA, DARPA, and then some local governments, which have been really, really strong in this area. Yeah, I was, uh, I was just laughing, thinking about uh, marketing. I mean, that you go to public policy school so, you know, your, your private sector colleagues go to business school, and if you're interested in the public sector or the, and the nonprofit sector, you go to public policy school and you learn a very different set of skills, but actually those skills are increasingly overlapping. And, but I love the idea of having partnership officers or um, uh, Matt Marzun, when he was ambassador to the United Kingdom, he created an office of network engagement. And he was way ahead of the curve, but he was also, he came out of technology and he thought in network terms and he immediately thought about all the folks that the US needed to engage in the UK and how to build networks, not just to, to engage them individually or to engage or to, to, to uh, connect to existing networks. And I thought, you know, if we could just replicate that, that would, that would be wonderful. Um, so, Bill, I just have to uh, uh, come back to you for a second to ask you to elaborate on that, because one of the things you say in the book is that you talk about catalytic government and you describe the role of government not as managing or delivering solutions, which is definitely what many of us think of when we think of, of government, but rather shaping and integrating solutions. So I wanted to ask you to expound a little on that, and then I'm going to turn to Ayushian to talk about data. Well, absolutely. If you look at the three major pieces of legislation passed over the last 16 months, uh, you, and we're talking about the Infrastructure Act, IAJA, the Inflation Reduction Act, IRA, which really focused on climate, and the Competes Act uh, focused on semiconductors and competitiveness, put them all together. It's a $2 trillion in investment in American competitiveness and you add them up and probably the biggest investment we've seen in, in decades. And yet when you actually unpack where all that money has gone, the vast majority of it is through indirect tools of government, such as tax credits, competitive grants, contracts, and so on. Uh, because with the understanding, say climate, is a great example of this where the private sector is gonna to have to do the majority of the funding in this. So there, we're using these indirect tools uh, in regulation as another one to actually spur innovation and in clean energy technologies, infrastructure, sustainability practices, and 
being able to use those tools in a very deft way is really important. Another example, we write a lot about homelessness in the book, and hopefully I can talk a little bit about what Houston has done, which has been amazing. But in Washington State and California, in order to ease the affordable housing crisis, what we've seen is this explosion in accessory dwelling units or ADUs or sometimes called granny flats to create more affordable housing. And as a result, one in five housing units now built in California is an ADU. So how did they do that? They did it through regulatory changes and through tax credits and some grants. So they use these other tools as opposed to direct government funding. So the deft use of those tools as a government, as a catalyst, is really one of the most important roles the government can play, whether it's in public health innovation, whether it's a, a climate solutions, whether it's encouraging the commercial space industry or workforce development. And, um, and that's something you just don't hear enough about, but it's absolutely critical. Love that. Uh, so I, I usually, we often, you know, the, the standard line is what, what gets measured gets managed. <laughs> uh, and yeah, one of the things that Bill says is um, that make data the language, uh, the language of, of this cross-boundary government, public-private work, um, because data not only creates the information, but I love this, the shared grammar for acting on it. Uh, and you spent your life or a lot of your, your career uh, working with data and thinking about uh, how to use data. So I wanted to, I wanted to ask you about that. Absolutely. Um, the, you know, we have a sort of quip here, you get what you measure and you don't get what you don't measure, right? And I think that's sort of the flip side of the story is, um, data practices, good data practices, uh, data cleanliness um, or data sanitation uh, really varies widely across agencies and widely across programs, forms of service delivery. And unfortunately, um, something that you know Jim was mentioning earlier is is um, it replicates a lot of the demographic, income, race, uh, gender, sexuality, and other politicized identities across the US um, in this context replicates them in our databases as well. Um, and so filling that sort of gap in data um, and making sure that services are being delivered for the folks that need it most. Um, and when I say delivered, I'm not looking just to government parties, I'm looking to all the folks we've been um, discussing, right, who are at the table in this proverbial dinner party, right, you have all three sectors <laughs> represented and more, um, what, what does that look like, right, how are we connecting um, with an eye to those gaps, I'll point to some of the work of um, an organization called the Gov Lab, um, started formerly by Beth Novak and run by Stefan Broholst, and they've been doing some really phenomenal work, trying to connect um, effectively, I'll call it data exhaust between uh, private company data and government or governmental and other nonprofit bodies, civil sector uh, players that could benefit from that kind of information. So thinking about even um, the impact of uh, telecoms data, so mobile data on designing transit systems that are gender inclusive in countries where women feel less safe traveling at certain hours of the day, right? And, and using their phone patterns to understand where they need to go and how to build systems for that sort of transportation need, as opposed to maybe the sort of gendered transportation need of going just to your office and back to your house in recurring patterns. Um, instead, having to go to childcare, having to go to, to school sites, to grocery stores, so on and so forth. Um, and so I think that's really fascinating is thinking about the role of data and the role of data owned by different sorts of players to create a different kind of landscape and different kind of field. Um, and I'll add two sort of legislative numbers uh, beyond the um, legislation that Bill named in the last 16 months that have also been really critical on this front. Um, you know, the state and local fiscal recovery fund, the CARES Act, and the Inflation Reduction Act are, we're talking... 350 billion for state and local fiscal recovery. We're talking 500 billion for the Inflation Reduction Act and 2.2 trillion for the CARES Act. Um, so that kind of money, right? Over $3 trillion focused on implementation for low-income folks alone 
what we really need is information on low and middle income families across the US and where the gaps are. Um, and I think this is a 100% of a cross sector uh, solution space. Great, thanks. Um, yes, <laughs> data and dollars and putting them together. But again, it comes to thinking about, uh, you know, how we educate people, how we train people. And there's a there's a question about that. We've got uh, about 14 minutes and a number of questions. You all have have uh, sparked a lively discussion. Uh, so, James, the uh, Jim, the first one is is uh, for you. And I also invite you to to comment uh, on on anything you just heard. Uh, have you explored federal land and resource management, federal land and resource management agencies use of stakeholder collaboration? So, like the Forest Service and how they work. Uh, uh, and that's a question from Karen Bradshaw. Oh, thank you. And that's a great question. Yes, so Forest Service actually is probably one of the most forward leaning of the domestic agencies working in partnerships. Um, and uh, you know, it's funny that they sit at the US Department of Agriculture because the Department of Agriculture itself does have a partnership unit. Um, and every few years they come back to me and they say, you know, we're interested in setting up a public private partnership office. And I'm like, you realize you have the crown jewel sitting in your crown right now. It's the forest service. They're the ones who are out doing this. They have training, they have officers that work on this. It is, they're the, they're out in front. Um, and, and they, frankly, I'm going to say, you know, one of the things I did want to mention is you talked about other pieces, data is important. Um, generative AI, I think we're all playing with it. We're all trying it out. We're putting together invitations using it. We're having conversations with it. Um, it is a little scary from a national security perspective too, because the data sets that it's pulling from contain some biases. Um, and that's something that we all need to be concerned about is what are those biases? Uh, where, where is the information coming from? And then what can be manipulated? Um, what can those data sets, how can those data sets be manipulated by our adversaries uh, in the future? And, and those are all things that we're looking at in the national security space, in the intelligence space. Those are things that we are taking very seriously over. Well, that absolutely keys up the, uh, tees up the next question. Uh, before I get to it, I also wanted to, to note on this idea of data exhaust. Um, which itself is so interesting. Uh, New America's Future of Land and Housing has been working on a model uh, for how you could determine property rights in Ukraine and other destroyed uh, uh, places from conflict or, or natural disaster that, you know, the deed to your house may be washed away, but your cell phone will show that you were there that you were there overnight, that you were there so that, that you could use electronic uh, uh, signals, data exhaust to prove things like uh, ownership and thereby speed reconstruction, which is often tremendously impeded in all sorts of circumstances by the need to provide documents. But on this national security point, there is a question from Eduardo Masio Paredes. Hello, Eduardo, I haven't seen you for a long time. Uh, so, Bill, I'm going to turn this to you, but Jim uh, will also have probably some reflections. How much uh, has Silicon Valley, the, the West's competitive advantage, uh, been part of the problem, a, a sort of broader problem of undermining democracy, and the flip of how can tech focus its strength to strengthen democracy? So I think, uh, Bill, I'm going to turn this to you with sort of the double-sided perception here of, of how, how uh, 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 technology is used. Well, I, I actually, I think I'll let I'll let Jim take that one on since that's more of, uh, of his expertise here. But but before I, I did that, just getting back on the data side of it, I, I did want to just give a, a great example. I we we've talked so much about data, and I wrote a lot about it in my book, Delivering on Digital. And the the key thing now is we really do need systems that are cross sector data sharing systems because if you're operating these systems that involve many different providers uh kind of a government only approach is not going to work and one of the great examples of this that we talk about in the book is houston uh where they were able to reduce homelessness over the last decade by 63 percent while it was going up everywhere else if the rest of the country had been able to replicate Houston's success, we'd have 200,000 less unhoused people in the country today. 
And one of the key elements of weaving together the more than 100 partners uh, that Houston had uh, working with the Houston Coalition for the Homelessness was the coalition's data system. And it really helped each provider understand each homeless person's individual needs and concerns and share that information with others in the system before they couldn't see what anyone else was doing. So there was a lot of duplication and replication. And then so in Houston, data doesn't just function as a deliverable, but as really the map that gives providers a fuller view of the actual individuals behind the data and what their needs are. They've housed 25,000 people, and this system is really, really important to that. And I think you can go across many different human services in other areas, and the need for these kinds of systems can really have a transformative impact. And with that, Jim, I'll, I'll, I'll turn it over to you with that uh, Silicon Valley question. Yeah, uh, that's a fantastic question, and I, I love the Houston example, too. I think that's really important for us domestically to be thinking about how do we work better with our, our people across this all, across all sectors to improve lives uh, of American citizens. And I, I will come back. 2009, um, Anne-Marie, we were at state. Um, I held the first TED at state. Uh, it, was a, it was kind of a, a seminal moment um, where we brought together sort of the best of TED. Uh, 800 people piled into the auditorium. It was an awesome experience. But the biggest thing that came out of that was Clay Shirky, a professor from NYU, uh, talked about the next revolution is coming via Twitter. And at the time, there were about three of us at the Department of State that were on Twitter in 2009. It was such a <laughs> new platform. Me. We I didn't get on until 2013. <laughs> yeah, so so many of us weren't on it, but I, I got on because I knew the TED folks were on it and I wanted to be one of the cool kids. But Clay Shirky said, the next revolution is coming via Twitter. And I was like, all right, what does that mean? 10 days later, the Iranian protests broke out um, and we saw them using Twitter as the platform where they were organizing themselves. We realized quickly technology was playing a role that hadn't played before. That you know, people were using these platforms to engage with one another, to coordinate with one another. And and frankly, that that has only grown significantly over time. More and more platforms uh, across the world. We actually need to have robust partnerships with Silicon Valley and with tech companies around the world, so that we're able to talk with them about concerns uh, in society and ensuring that people are getting good information, that that they're not being manipulated. Uh, that, that fake videos can be identified easily. Uh, if you look at the example of um, uh, President Putin, who was spoofed on, on their television channels where he was, uh, you know, his image was used, his voice was used by AI, um, talking about, you know, the, the situation in Ukraine. I mean, those are real issues that we are all going to face moving forward. So I come back to the idea of the partnership officer. You need someone in government who can build trust build trust with Silicon Valley. That person needs to be around for a while, um, which means you need to find a way to progress someone in their career in that partnership officer series because you need that person to be there for five, 10, 15 years to, to help build that relationship because relationships are not institution to corporation, they're people to people. Uh, and that takes uh, takes required skills, but it re takes required people to be in the institutions, and they need a career trajectory to do that. It also means a change in government hiring practices, particularly into state or USAID, because you need folks who can come. Those tri-sector athletes have to be able to move from the private sector to the public sector to the civic sector. And of course, the foreign service rules make that almost impossible. Uh, and so... Um, Ayushi, you said you mentioned that you uh, uh, you teach at the Kennedy School, and even as the former dean of the Princeton School of Public International Affairs, we recognize that school up to the north. Uh, and <laughs> Anne Florini, who I happen to know is yet another Princeton graduate, but she she says uh, rightly uh, that public policy schools and even business schools rarely teach these skills. And and Bill already mentioned uh, there's an appendix in this book to teach it, and it's got case studies, and it's really a a, a wonderful blueprint. 
But I wonder, um, if, you know, what you're teaching and, and from your perspective, how we would need to overhaul the curricula of these schools to educate a whole generation of bridge builders uh, to go into multiple sectors. It's, a, it's such a good question. I know, um, you know, I, I have a lot of respect for the people who have to put together the curriculum for such a large program and so many students from different backgrounds. And I will not admit to knowing anything about developing curriculum at such a scale. But um, as a, you know, member of uh, the faculty in a small way, I'll say it, it's it's really eye opening. It's been eye opening for me. I teach about digital government. I teach about building software and products in a publicly managed space, right? As opposed to building products for Silicon Valley companies. Um, and what's been fascinating for me as an educator in that context is students. This is their first time engaging with conversations around iterative development, around product management practices, around waterfall versus agile, about the implications of waterfall versus agile development on the way that budgeting is done in the public context, right? Um, we're talking about the difference between capital and operating expenditures. That has different implications for how you build products in the public context and for the public good. And that to me has been eye-opening, that these conversations are actually the first time they're hearing about it, especially when if they are to move into the Deloittes of the world or state agencies or community benefits organizations, even adjacent and nonprofits, that kind of familiarity will go a long way as they're literally working to deliver public goods and services um, with whatever hat on. So I think that's the one piece I will name is the value of an education for public policy students and public policy schools that doesn't just focus on landing their students' jobs within the government context, but in the larger world of delivery and what that means for you know uh, teaching practices outside of, of those traditional job descriptions in government. Absolutely. Uh, and I, always, I say, as a former dean of a school of public and international affairs, that you would never let anybody graduate from a school like that without a basic, more than a basic knowledge of economics. You have to have macro and micro and basic statistics. I mean, you have to understand how the economy works and you have to understand how the political system works. Well, you need at least that level of knowledge about how technology works. I mean, you don't have to be a technologist, but if you don't have to be an economist, but you have to know how to engage with them. All right, Bill, we've got two minutes, sadly, um, and I'm going to uh, give you a final question and there are a number, I apologize to those of you, we didn't get to your questions. Um, but you, you, this is, I think, an interesting, you say, what's your definition of the private sector, which I think is important here, and where you, do you see the role of philanthropy? So that's the, the question. I'm going to ask you also, though, to just close us out by talking about what image should we take away that is not the vending machine? Right, that 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 is such a clear. Here's the old view of government. What should be the new view of government in a world of bridge building? Well, I'll take the last question first, and I think uh, I think you actually, Anne Marie, you illustrated that it's it's a web, right? It's a it's a web, and government's not always going to be this at the center of these ecosystems or webs. It's going to play different roles. It's going to have different levers. And, and that's the way to look at it. It's complex, a lot more complex to do this, but you're going to end up with better results. And lastly, the role of foundations is so critical. We wrote a lot about this in my book, Solution Revolution, 10 years ago. And, and that's something where the U.S. is really blessed. Our foundation sector is probably like 10x, 20x, 100x any other country in the world. We have largest civic society, and those foundations are a really key part of this not notion of bridge building and blended government that we that we talk to, and they're providing a lot of public value, I believe. And the other thing we haven't talked about is the rise of social enterprises. Uh, yeah. where we have tens of millions of social enterprises. The last thing I'll say is uh, when I, I spoke on Solution Revolution to over 20 different business schools, and sometimes with a public policy school, at almost every one of those schools, the most popular club in those schools was the Social Enterprise Social Entrepreneurs Club. 
And so we see a rise in purpose in the private sector and the rise of that. And I think that's all for the good. And really, government needs to really understand that purpose landscape so they can leverage it effectively. Well, thank you. And we could have gone on easily for another half hour. So I'm going to remind you again uh, that the book is Bridge Builders. It's really about how we all come together to address the public problems that require private, civic, and public actors to solve with very specific techniques uh, and approaches and examples uh, of the ways this is these problems are being solved and the leaders, the bridge builders who are solving them. So Jim and Bill and Ayushi, thank you all. Thank you to the New America staff who allowed us to do this. Uh, and thank you to the audience. Have a great afternoon.